I love that I get to be part of the Hills Church. Even, and you probably expect me to say that, as being one of the, the pastors here, but even if I wasn't part of the leadership team, I would love being part of the Hills Church. Last Sunday, Church in the Park, Soul Food Sunday, was just such an encouraging time together. Um, just breaking bread, um, worshiping with you. It was so good. And I can't wait till we do that again in July. July 17th, we'll be back at Church in the Park, City of Axon Park. I hope you'll put it on your calendar. Now, do you ever find it challenging to live out your faith? Like you believe in Jesus, you, you want to follow him, but there seems to be so much going against you. And the reasons, you know, I think everyone has, has felt that, but maybe for different reasons, uh, maybe similar reasons. Uh, but some of the reasons um, it's difficult, can be difficult to follow Jesus are just the number of church uh, scandals over the last few years. Like these high profile leaders uh, abusing power, shaming victims, just doing unspeakable things. And it, it's just done so much harm. It's done so much harm. So you got church scandals, you've got just the, the cultural climate. There was a time when uh, culturally uh, Christianity was, was more acceptable and most people you know, had some type of faith or, or background or they grew up in church and, and that's not the, the case anymore. And Christians are often not seen in a, in a positive, positive light. But that goes back to my, my first <laughs> uh, hurdle, the church scandals and and hypocrisy within in the church. And so you combine the church scandals and the cultural climate, it can be difficult to live out our faith in anything more than just a silent kind of way. Just, just like my personal faith, it's something I do, you know, that's good for me, and I try not to bring it up. Um, I was reading an article this week by a Gen Zer, and he's a believer, and in the article he was, he was talking about habits of Generation Z, that the church should be aware of, that the church should, should know about. Um, and one of the habits that he says is, when I talk to my non-Christian friends about church, I usually need to lead with an apology. Yep, I'm sorry. It's one of the, the habits of, of Gen Z um, and uh, millennials as, as well. But he, this is what he said. He said, during my first couple years of college, I was a server and a bartender all but two of my coworkers were 16 to 30 year olds who were either atheists or agnostic. And almost all of them had stories about how the church had hurt them or their families. So if I wanted to have any form of evangelistic or spiritual conversation with them, I had to first apologize for something I had nothing to do with and convince them that not every Christian is judgmental or abusive. You, you want to follow Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. But it's hard. And we've been called to live in such a way that at times it's going to put us at opposition with what's happening around us, with, with social norms. And, um, and this is not a new phenomenon in church history. There is an account in the New Testament book of Acts. And Acts is a story um, about how my life got flipped, turned upside down. No, it's not. I'm just seeing if you're paying attention. But it is a story of how the early church turned the world upside down. That, that statement is, is made in, in the book by those who are not Christians. That these Christians that turned the world upside down. But it's the story of, of how the gospel, what happened with the Jesus story after Jesus. So after Jesus uh, rose from the dead, after he ascended to the Father, this church starts in Jerusalem and it begins to expand into the areas around. It keeps going and finally goes all the way throughout uh, the Roman Empire. And it's done by, by different people, a lot of unnamed people as, as they travel and, and merchants. Uh, but one of the people who are highlighted in the book of Acts is Paul. And Paul, he takes these trips. We, looking back now, we call them missionary journeys. And, uh, but he takes them, uh, starts, starts in Jerusalem and, and usually goes up and then heads over into close to Rome, comes back uh, several times. And, and on one of his journeys, he ends up in 
Thessalonica, an important city in Macedonia. You can take a look at the map there. Thessalonica is up towards the top in the middle. And the Romans built a 700 mile highway from Rome to the west. Not exactly from Rome because there was a you know, Mediterranean, kind of gets in the way. Uh, but, but a 700 mile highway called uh, the Via Ignatia, I believe it's called, or the Ignatian Way. And it ran uh, 700 miles from east to west, and Thessalonica was, was one of the, the stops on the highway. So there's travelers, there's commerce, it's a port city, so it's a very metropolitan kind of place. Paul's traveling with a couple of companions, Silas and Timothy, and you can read about this in Acts chapter 17. And when Paul gets to Thessalonica, he goes into the synagogue. Paul's Jewish. He believes that Jesus is the, the Jewish Messiah. So he goes into synagogue. Acts 17 says for, for three Sundays, three Sundays, three Sabbath days. Um, and his message is simple. First, he opens the scriptures and he shows that the Messiah must suffer. And in Greek, the word for Messiah is Christ. The Christ must suffer and rise from the dead. Second, it says he proclaims Jesus to them. Doesn't go into a whole lot of detail, but you can imagine how he, yeah, how he might have proclaimed Jesus, what he might have said about Jesus, his, his life, his, his death, his resurrection. And then the third thing is that he tells them that Jesus is the Christ. In other words, the, the, the Hebrew prophecies, the prophecies of old had been fulfilled in Jesus so that the Jesus of history and the Christ of Scripture were the same person. And, and some of the Jews believed. And then there were some, some Gentiles who were uh, kind of connected to the, to the synagogue. They believed. And then there were prominent women in the city, it says, specifically prominent women in the city who came to faith in Jesus. Uh, and as Paul's following, as his influence grows in Thessalonica, not everyone, not everyone's happy about it. Some of the Jews who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah don't like the fact that Paul, he's getting more followers, he's getting more likes, he's getting more subscriptions, which if you haven't liked and subscribed, go ahead and do that in the, I don't know, it's over here? <laughs> I see the, the YouTubers, the, the influencers. Anyway, um, go ahead and <laughs> like and subscribe. But <clears throat> Paul's gaining, gaining a following, people are are turning to Jesus, and there was a contingency uh, amongst the Jews who were not happy about it. And so it, the, the passage in Acts 17 says they round up some, some bad characters. However, <laughs> you want to think about that. It says that in verse 6. And they start a riot in the city. They run into Jason's house. We don't know who Jason is. It just says they run into Jason's house. Um, he's probably hosting Paul and his companions. Paul isn't there, so they drag Jason out. Um, and there's some other believers, and they bring him before the city officials, and they charge them with high treason. This is what it says, Acts 17, verse 6. It says, These men uh, who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decree, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. And at that, the, the crowd, the city officials, they're thrown into a turmoil. However, Paul, as a master, had hide and seek. Because they can't find him. It's like, where's Waldo? Where's Paul? They don't know. And that night, under the cover of darkness, Paul skips town. Paul leaves. Um, it, so he was only there a short time. We're not, he's probably there more than, more than three weeks, but maybe, maybe a couple months. We're, we're not told, and, and when we read these, passages in in the Bible it feels like it's happening quick but a lot of it happens over a course of, of years but most likely just a couple months he was just there a couple months the, the text isn't clear but you can appreciate why the crowd and the city officials would be upset Caesar Caesar was king and the charges that Paul is claiming there is a different king and, and Paul and his friends were announcing they were modeling in their own lives a different way of being human, a different kind of community, and, and all because they had a very different kind of king. So Paul leaves town. He heads south, kind of actually heads a little bit west and a little bit south to, to Berea, 
to, to start with. And, but he's nervous. Paul's nervous about the church that he just established in Thessalonica. Because, and he's only there a couple weeks. Uh, some of the, the people who trusted Jesus were, were Jews. And, and they would know of, of the, uh, the Jewish God. They would know the character of God. But a lot of people who, who put their, um, their trust in Jesus were people who were worshiping idols, pagans. We'll, we'll see that in, in later study as, as we go. Um, so they don't, Paul wasn't there very long. They don't, like this, this is all new to them. And so they don't have a concept. They don't have a deep theology. They don't have like even a foundation memory uh, of, of like sin, of atonement, of salvation. They were just blank slates. Paul's only there a couple months. He had to leave in turmoil. The new believers, as Paul's leaving, they're being dragged out of their homes. And so he is concerned. Like, would, would they be faithful? In, in that environment? Would they continue to follow Jesus? Did, did they know what it looked like to follow Jesus? Would they return to their old pagan practices? Would they just go along with the crowd? And, and so Paul travels to Berea, and he goes down to, to Athens, and here's what happens there. And this is from 1 Thessalonians. Paul's writing this now. He says, Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left behind at Athens alone. And we sent Timothy, our brother and God's servant, in the gospel of Christ to you in your faith and to exhort you. And so Paul's traveling. He gets to Athens. He's like, I, I got to send Timothy. So Timothy goes back and, and gets them further instruction. He, uh, he's able to see like what's happening there. And then he, he leaves them and comes back to Paul. Now, by this time, Paul's gone even farther. He's gone on to Corinth where he, we do know that he stays for a few years. And so Timothy reports back to Paul everything that's happening in Thessalonica. And Paul, <clears throat> Paul concludes he needs to write them a letter. He needs to, to greet them. Um, he was hoping to go back, hasn't been able to get back yet. and um, So he writes them a letter. And the letter that he writes is possibly the oldest existing Christian document that we have. Scholars go back and forth a little bit if it's the oldest or the second oldest, but, but most would say that the letter that he wrote, that Paul wrote, is the oldest Christian document that we have. And he writes to this young church in a place where following Jesus was not going to be easy. It, it wasn't going to be easy. And it's the letter that we call 1 Thessalonians. And for the next, the next eight weeks, uh, about eight weeks, with some, some breaks in there. Um, we're going to take eight weeks to, to look through this letter of First uh, Thessalonians. And I believe as we take a look at this letter, it's going to call us to hope and holiness in a hostile world. Hostile world. Hope and holiness in a hostile world. And I, I love that image of the flower coming up through the concrete. Like that is not a good environment for the flower to thrive, but yet it is, it is thriving. And so this letter gives us a, just a window into like how Paul is, uh, is, is teaching, what he thinks is important to, these, uh, to this early church, like what this church in, in Thessalonica, maybe their weaknesses, their, their strengths, and their theological, their moral problems. So how are they doing? What was the report from Timothy? Did they survive? Yes. Yes, they, they did survive. An emphatic yes. In fact, they weren't just like surviving. They were thriving. And Paul is, is pleased. Paul is proud uh, of how they have been following Jesus. And he's relieved that they have not given in to the pressure of violent opposition. So Paul writes this letter. It's, it's broken uh, into two parts. The, the first half of it is, is a celebration. Like of, of how they've been doing in their faith. And then the last half of the letter is a challenge. Keep growing in your faith. Here's some, some things you might need to, to work on. So let's jump in. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. 
We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 1 begins with just a very standard greeting. Just like our letters today have a very standard way of writing a letter. Dear so-and-so. Ancient letters, you started with your own name first. Who was writing the letter? So Paul <clears throat> is writing. He's with uh, Silas and, and Timothy. And then you uh, identify your audience. Uh, and it would be easy to, to quickly pass over this first verse. And it's not uncommon. Like you're reading, oh, okay, who's writing, who's... But as I was uh, looking at these verses this week, I was, I was just reminded uh, that what we are part of is, is more than just a human institution. It says, to the church, in God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Like the, the assembly of God, the assembly of Jesus, and somehow the Hills Church. And every local church is more than just an earthly institution. More than just like-minded people getting together, passing the time. We are part of something heavenly, even if at times we act hellishly. We are part of something heavenly, something eternal, even if at times we don't live up to our calling. This is God's church. This is the church of Jesus Christ. It is from the Father and the Son that every church derives its life, and drives its strength. This is no ordinary community gathering. The church has its identity in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ because of what God has done through Christ. We have been brought into the community and we're incorporated into Christ. And and Paul, remember he is writing to this mixed group of people, some some Jews, some Gentiles, uh, former uh, idol worshipers, and they all together, regardless of their, their background, regardless of if, like, um, regardless, they're one church in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, grace and peace to you. And again, we have a tendency to, to rush past the greeting, but this is a uniquely Christian greeting. The normal uh, Greco-Roman way to to open a letter or to greet someone was just the word greetings, greetings. But Paul's life has been so transformed by the gospel that even the the greetings that he gives, it, this is his pretty standard greeting in, in his letters, grace and peace. Even the greeting has been uh, Christianized, has been overcome by the gospel. And, and the word greetings and grace in the Greek language there's just a couple letters difference. And so Paul is like he's he's just kind of changing up just a little bit. So it's it's a familiar greeting, but he's saying grace and peace to you. And the the total, the sum total of God's activity towards us is found in the word grace. Nothing is deserved, nothing is achieved. And the benefits of that grace is peace. The benefit of God's grace to us is peace, God's shalom, now and to come. And and when you've experienced God's grace, you can live in peace. When we've experienced God's grace, we, we can live in peace. And the latter flows from the former. Peace flows from grace. And Paul, having experienced God's grace, grace so lavishly, so deeply, he's always ready to extend grace to others. Grace and peace to you. If only that would be our demeanor towards one another and our divided nation. Grace to you. Peace to you. Paul then gives thanks to the Thessalonians. And and again, this uh, this is common throughout the letters in the New Testament. There's the greeting. There's a word of thanks. Which What makes this uh, statement of thanks so so unique is that it's usually very clear like to give thanks and let me get to the body of my letter but the thanksgiving that Paul gives just kind of goes on and goes on and goes on so that some scholars think that the thanksgiving portion of the letter actually extends all the way into chapter 3 
Like, we thank God, we thank God, we thank God for you. Here's what he says. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. These are powerful these are powerful verses. Timothy must have reported how God was at work among them. And it must not have been like in a, in a small way. The, the report that he brings back must have been like these people are following. They are all in. They are all in. And they're already displaying these very Christian virtues. Faith, love, hope. And, and we, we, when we think about these virtues, it's usually in the terms of like a, an inner... Um, it's like inner virtues, matters of the heart. But Paul won't allow that, and he moves them very quickly from the abstract to the concrete. So these are not just merely inner virtues, but each is pro productive. Uh, they produce something. There, there is like a byproduct to the faith, love, and hope. And, and true faith leads to something. True love, it, it leads something. And true hope leads to something, like it, some type of action. And so this is just something that we take out of the wardrobe on, on Sunday and put on. But this is something that we're to, to wear throughout the entire week. He's it, like, faith works, love labors, hope endures. And it, it doesn't get any more practical than that. True faith is more than just a mere mental ascent to a set of beliefs. And, but what, what kind of work are we talking about when, it, when he's talking about this uh, work produced by faith? What's the work? We don't know exactly. It doesn't go on to say. But when you read the rest of the letter, you get an idea of the type of work that the Thessalonians were doing that I think Paul is referring to here when he talks about this work produced by faith. Um, one, one way they were working is by spreading the good news. They were taking the, the gospel. People around them were, were coming to faith. Another way, another, thing they were, another way they were working is they were their acts of goodness towards others. And third, they were displaying a loyalty to Jesus in the face of persecution, in the face of trials. That, that, that in itself was a, a work, and this, and this looks a lot like the work of the kingdom. So true faith demonstrates itself in this kind of, of work, bringing the good news that the, the new king is, is coming, doing God's will on earth as it is in heaven. It makes us just pause and consider, like, how is my faith working? Like, how is my faith working? How is it being productive? Uh, in love, and if love doesn't labor, it's just sentimental. Sentimentalism. It has no teeth. In other places in the New Testament, labor is translated as toil. It denotes the kind of work that gets you fatigued. I'm talking about like the end of a, a good, hard day of work. Like, you're just exhausted. You've labored. That's, that's the idea of this, this work here, that the type of, of love that the Thessalonians had and that, that we are to have, a love that is, is costly, a love that, a love that is self-sacrificing, a love that is like the love of God towards us, that um, talks about, the scripture says that, um, I'm, going, I'm going blank here, I know what it says. <laughs> you, can, you can trust me. Um, I don't know, can you trust me? Uh, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That self-sacrificing type of love. And I, I know you've loved like that at, at times. But this is the kind of love that isn't based on how worthy or lovable the recipient is. Because there are people who are easy to love. Um, and there are people in our lives who... Depending on the day of the week, sometimes we're easy to love, sometimes not so much. And that's usually the, the people closest to us, I would imagine. But our call is to love until it is exhausting. Until it is exhausting. And then you get into hope. And this hope that endures, it's more than just optimism. Optimism is, is usually based on temperament. I, I tend to be an optimistic person, I, I think. Um, that's temperament. This is not, hope is not based on temperament. Hope is based on 
theology. And that Christ is coming back, and we'll talk more about that in, in coming weeks. So faith, love, and hope, they're all productive, but not only that, each of them is outgoing. They're outward focused, and these are not me-centered. These are not me-focused. Our, our faith is directed towards God. Our, our love is directed towards others in the church, out of the church. Our hope is directed towards the future. And these are characteristics of a life that has been made new by Jesus. These are the characteristics of a life that has been made new by Jesus. So we work, we labor, we endure, and we become less self-focused and more God-oriented, more others-oriented, all the while enduring because of this deep hope that we have. And and this endurance, it just prevents us from indulging in self-pity, even when times are hard. I mean, Going back again to the Thessalonians and what they were going through, even knowing that they were being dragged out of the houses, and, um, and we'll talk more about some of the persecution that they faced in the coming weeks, but in that environment, this is the characteristics that they were um, exemplifying, the characteristics that they were living out. And at the end of verse 3, it says, Their hope in our Lord Jesus Christ hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so with Jesus at the center, it is possible for our faith to thrive even in hostile places. And I, and I don't want to have a combative attitude of like us and them, but I just, back to my original questions, like it is not easy to follow Jesus. There, there are many, there's outward pressures, inward pressures, things that would keep us would hold us back. And I want to encourage you that, that we you're not alone in this. This has been the story of many Christians throughout hundreds, even thousands of years, but they have been faithful. They have ex- exhibited the faith and this love and hope. And it's my prayer that we would be marked by these same characteristics. So does your faith work? Does your love work? labor? Does your hope endure? Does your hope endure? And we're going to unpack those questions a bit more in microchurches uh, this weekend. Oh, homework for next, next Sunday and in the coming weeks. I would love for you to read the letter of First Thessalonians from start to finish without stopping in a single setting. It'll take you about 15 minutes maybe a little longer if you're going slow, and just as, as we go in the coming weeks, to, to read through it several times. And we'll talk about some things you can do as you read through it to begin to absorb it more. Um, but that, that's your, your homework, my, my challenge for you uh, next week, to read First Thessalonians. So let me, let me pray for us, and then we'll be finished for today. <clears throat> Jesus, I'm so grateful for the testimony of of those who have gone before us, those who have have faced harder times than than we face here in in America, and they thrived. And they were um, saints, and they, they shine like the stars, and Father, we, we want to have that same testimony. God, that when future generations look back on us, they will be able to say, like, like Paul said of them, that they, they had this, this faith that, that worked. They had this love that labored. They had this hope that endured. Jesus, because you were at the center. Your life, your death, your resurrection. And, and so may we be empowered by you. May our lives exemplify these same characteristics. In your name I pray. Amen. Grace and peace to you.